So it's paid a quick check of my bank account and I am indeed now rich. New shoes, new TV, fancy takeaway, and I'm now poor again. Most people, at least, don't get paid in wads of cash, which means that payday is just a number on a screen. That it's so easy to spend with a combination of Apple Pay plus online shopping for an easy dopamine hit. But that is not, of course, how I've gone in just the last three years from a net worth of negative £50,000 to a net worth of £200,000. So in this video, I am sharing the nine things that happen automatically with my finances every single payday to decrease my tax bill, increase my savings and investments, reduce my spending and make me richer. And step number one is probably the most pivotal, is to realize you're not rich. It's payday, your bank balance is up 2,000 pounds, and so what? 100 pounds on a new pair of shoes and 750 quid on a weekend away to Paris. I've earned it. After all, I've been working crazily hard for the last month to earn that money. So why is it that we make these payday splurges, even though we know deep down they're bad for our finances? Well, the first reason is an over-reliance on the dopamine hit that we get every two or four weeks when we get paid by buying new stuff. Essentially, what happens is you get tied into a job you don't necessarily like or find enjoyment in, and you then rely on these dopamine hits to get you through your everyday working life. And the second reason is what experts call mental accounting. It's essentially where rather than actually tracking the reality of your finances in a notebook or a spreadsheet, you instead try to mentally track how much income you have, what you think your spending has been for that month, and how much you have left to spend. Essentially, you're making financial buying decisions based on what you think you have rather than what you actually have. Now, there are tons of steps you can take to prevent payday splurges, and we are going to run through those in the rest of the video. But the first step is always just to stop viewing your finances as fluctuating from poverty in the run up to payday to being loaded in the week after payday, and instead to realize that you are just as rich the day before payday as the day after it. Step two is then to reduce your tax bill and the average UK worker pays 23.6% of their income in tax. And that's before you account for taxes on stuff like property and basically everything that you buy day to day. So clearly finding ways to legally claw back some of that money every time you get paid will increase the pot of money you have to spend and save. And one of the best ways to decrease your tax bill is generally to pay more money into your pension plan or your 401k in the US or something similar wherever you're from. Now before even getting into the tax benefits of increasing the amount you're putting into your pension, most employers will match the amount of money up to a certain limit that you put into your own personal pension. So for example, if I put in 5% of my salary every month, my employer might match that 5%. You should absolutely be maxing out the amount you can put in that your employer will match. If you don't do this, you're essentially letting your employer get away with paying you less than they're contractually obliged to. Then on top of that, there are the tax benefits. Now, I know the system in the UK, but you should absolutely look up tax efficient ways of saving for your retirement or something like that. I'm pretty sure that in lots of countries, there'll be similar systems to incentivize people to save for old age. So here in the UK, up to certain limits, you can transfer amounts that you would have got paid yourself into a pension pot directly and not get taxed on that amount. So my current gross pre-tax salary is around £10,500 a month. I contribute 24% of that as an investment into my retirement. So that is around £2,500, meaning I actually only get taxed on £8,000 of my salary. Then I guess the question is how much of your salary should you invest in your retirement? And that really depends on the tax thresholds in your country. So look them up by putting the ones in the UK on screen now so I can walk you through how I'm thinking about this in a UK context. Essentially up to around £12,000 I wouldn't be putting anything into my pension because there are no tax benefits. If I earn up to £50,000 my tax rate is 20% so that means any money I put into my pension is effectively going to get an uplift of 20%. However that money is then locked away for 35 or 40 years for me at least so I'd probably only be looking to put in the amount that my employer matches perhaps 5 or 10%. If you earn over £50,000 your tax rate is then jumping up to 40%. So here is where the tax benefits really start to come in. And I would essentially be looking to put in as much over £50,000 as I could afford, maybe 10 to 15% of my salary. And then finally, over £100,000, the tax benefits of contributing to a pension start to get really amazing. My current rate of tax between £100 and £125,000 is 
actually effectively around 70%. So for me, I try to put in all of the money that I earn currently over £100,000 into my pension. And that's why I'm choosing to contribute 24% of my salary because that just about brings my salary under £100,000. Again, hopefully this has been helpful just to see how I think about contributing to my pension. Look up how you are taxed wherever you are from and how you can contribute to your retirement tax efficiently. So before I go any further, I know that money can be really difficult to talk about. It's something that gives people a lot of stress. I definitely psychologically have struggled with my relationship with money in the past. I know that's something that loads of other people struggle with too. So it may be that you find it helpful to get a therapist to help you through your relationship with money or anything else. And that's where today's paid partner, BetterHelp, comes in. Just as one example of when I have struggled with my mental health, I really struggled in my second year of university, putting tons of pressure on myself to study all the time, comparing myself to others, and making myself so anxious that I developed IBS. At that time, speaking to a therapist massively helped me, and so I began regular therapy using BetterHelp as a preventative tool to look after my mental health talking to my therapist whenever I felt I wanted to talk about any anxieties I had and ways to reduce my stress. BetterHelp's onboarding assesses your needs and connects you, usually within 48 hours, with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and to give you helpful, unbiased advice. You can use the time with your therapist as suits you, all from your phone or computer via phone call, video chat or messaging. So yeah, let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can support you from the comfort of your own home at betterhelp.com forward slash Liam or just choose Liam Porritt during the sign up to get a special discount on your first month. Once you've moved a portion of your income into a tax efficient investment like a pension plan, the first thing you should be doing when you receive the balance is to set aside money for your needs. So I personally have three current or checking accounts that I use first of all to receive money from my employer, then second to pay out money on fixed bills and food, essentially my needs, and then third for my wants, so that's for day to day spending. So as soon as I get paid, I have an automatic transfer of a fixed amount of money every single month that goes towards number one, pay for my housing so for me that means rent number two my utilities everything from gas water electrics wi-fi phone bills and then third food just day-to-day -day food not like fancy restaurant expenses essentially review this amount every few months to make sure that inflation isn't meaning that i need more money for my needs but other than that it is the same every single month this is where the 50 30 20 rule comes in essentially no more than 50 percent of my income should be going into my needs account that means that Although it is tempting when you earn more money to upgrade, for example, where you're living. Beth and I nearly moved from where we currently are, where we pay £1,890 a month, to a new place that would have cost us upwards of £2,500 a month. But being really diligent in making sure your rent, as a general rule of thumb I use, is no more than 30% of income should be spent on rent or mortgage every month. Um, obviously depends exactly how much you earn. If you're on a really low salary, you might have to adjust this a little. And then food and utilities should take up around 10% of your income each and if they don't again it could be a function of your relatively low salary but it could also be that you need to take a long hard look at one your utility bills have you for example decided to get a new iPhone 15 Pro when you already had an iPhone 14 Pro for an extra 50 pounds a month and particularly look at switching between different providers of gas electric and water that can make a huge difference every single month and obviously food is a need but if you're spending 20 pounds a month on some fancy desserts it's probably not a need and maybe should be coming out of your wants account and you should just be looking at your spending overall to think if my needs on food is more than 10 percent of my spending should i actually cut out some of the more luxury items i'm buying for example changing from a really premium fever tree tonic water to aldi's own because beth and i did a blind taste test and i embarrassingly could not tell the difference once you've put aside money for your needs for the month, you should then be looking to pay off any credit card or payday loan style debt, very high interest debt. Now, I personally do use a credit card, but only ever for really big online purchases, like if I bought a new TV or particularly if I'm paying for travel, because generally you get loads of points for these big purchases. It's well worth using the credit card. I then pay that off within three days maximum out of my wants account, and I'll come onto that in a minute. Credit cards, obviously, do give you points and points mean prizes so i would at some point like to say beth on a business class upgrade or to a really nice hotel for free but i think the financial discipline i get from actually spending my own money that i've set aside in an account for the month so once that's all gone i can't spend any more money is well worth it over getting a few points on a credit card with my day-to-day -day expenditure 
But if you do use a credit card for all of your spending or just have any credit card debt outstanding, the next thing after setting aside money for your needs should absolutely be to pay off the maximum amount possible of your credit card or any other high interest loan debt. Then the next component of my personal finance routine comes from the personal finance classic, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it is to pay yourself first, very briefly, paying yourself first essentially means rather than waiting until the end of the month to save some money because you find inevitably you spent all of the money you had, you instead pay yourself first up front and then spend what you have left over so that you make sure every month you're moving money into a savings or investment account. Now, before I go through what I do with that 20%, which are the final steps of my payday routine, the key point with the wants account, which is where I'm putting 30% of my salary every month, is that you appreciate like that is all of the money you have every year for your your wants. So if you want to go on a nice holiday and that's going to cost you £3,000, you need to save money in your wants account to contribute to that. You should not be dipping into your 20% pay yourself first account in order to do nice things. Otherwise, the whole system is ruined. Okay, now you're being really responsible with your wants account. I want you to imagine that you have enough money in a totally separate account to cover six to nine months of all of your expenses if something bad were to happen to you or you were to lose your job. That is a pretty comfortable place to be and that is exactly where I am, having built up what is known in the world of personal finance as my emergency fund. Essentially take all of the money that you're spending every month on your needs and your wants around 80% of your post-tax monthly salary, multiply that by six or nine if you want to be really comfortable and try to save that amount of money first. Now that interest rates have gone up a bit, I personally keep that in an instant access savings account with the best rate of interest I can find on the market, around 4.5%. Okay, so once your emergency fund is full and you should fill it up completely until you move on to any of the other steps, I would then save around 50% of the money that I'm saving every month, and this depends on your stage in life, towards a deposit on your first home. So essentially you're putting around 10% of your monthly salary into a savings account for a deposit and usually a deposit of around 10% of the value of the property you want to purchase is about right. So I would recommend figuring out what the rough value of the property you think you might want to buy would be and then saving 10% of that value. And if you're in the UK and want to buy a property up to £450,000, a good place to put this money is into a lifetime ISA because the government basically gives you a bonus of £1,000 for every £4,000 you put in once a year. Okay, so final two steps. And the first is to pay off high interest long-term debt. So for me, essentially my student loan, which currently has an interest rate of a completely crazy 7.6%. Because of that interest rate, I am aggressively trying to pay off my student loan with that kind of 20% chance chunk of my salary every month at the moment. The other big bit of debt most people have is obviously a mortgage. And if you do have a mortgage, I would suspect the interest rate on it, even in the current high interest environment we live in, is probably lower than the average historic eight-ish percent yields of the stock markets. And so it probably doesn't make sense to pay off a mortgage early. Although there may be circumstances where it does make sense in your specific situation. And the final step of my payday routine is to invest in ETFs. And this is probably the most important step if you want to build wealth over the long term. Personally, I think that all people should have a requirement that 5% at least as a bare minimum of their income is going into the markets and it should be anywhere up to around 20%. That is the how much. Then the what for me is exchange traded funds, ETFs, because they give you hedged risk and also pretty low fees. I obviously cannot advise you on how you should invest your money, but I personally put around 70% into the S&P 500, 20% into the FTSE All World, around 10% into various different commodities depending on the month. But currently I'm putting money into gold, just building up a little bit of a hedge because generally speaking, those precious metal commodities go up if stock markets go down. And then finally, how should you invest your money? I personally use an app called Free Trade, but you should look up whatever app or platform you want to use. There are tons if you look online, but you should absolutely do it in the most, again, tax efficient way possible. So in the UK, we have vehicles called ISAs. Basically, anyone can set up a stocks and shares ISA. You can invest up to £20,000 a year and any returns on those investments will be tax free. In the US, the Roth IRA allows you to do something similar, although your money is locked away until you retire and elsewhere, there will be similar schemes. So look up how to invest tax efficiently. 
So yeah, this has been my nine step payday routine that has honestly completely transformed my finances. It stopped me overspending. It means that I guarantee an amount of money being put into investments and paying off my student debt every month. And it has radically improved my financial position and my net worth. And if you like this video, please, please do give it a like. Please do leave a comment down below to let me know what you thought. I massively appreciate your comments. Honestly, read every single one. And I look forward to speaking again very, very soon.